Mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love. of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is not a brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I've got hold of for the moment. And I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Good evening. I am Joan Bierman, president of the Leonard I. Bierman Foundation for Peace and Justice. On behalf of our board, welcome to this celebration on the 100th year birthday today of Leonard. We're also celebrating a generation of passionate and courageous leaders. We still need to be touched by them. At the same time, our intent is to build a living legacy, not only a remembrance of things past. To fulfill that purpose and to that extent, we have a wonderful board our board is Judith Bierman O'Hanlon, Eve Bierman, David Myers, Jane Olson, Salam al Mariotti, and James Lawson. I love them all. We all want to thank Ken Chasen and Leo Beck Temple for allowing us to join in this wonderful, wonderful tribute to Leonard. As we began to imagine our part in this event, Judith said, there's no better birthday gift for her father than to honor his friends. And for us, there's no friend more worthy to honor than Jim Lawson. Tonight too, in our hearts and in the hearts of so many here, we hold a special place of profound appreciation for Leonard's beloved friend and co-conspirator, George Regas, who died some months ago. And as Mary commented, she is sure that now Leonard and George are together making an enormous amount of trouble. As part of our mission, we continue to add more 
Bierman Fellows to our illustrious group. And as we do, we'll keep you informed about it. Tonight, one of our fellows will speak. These young, extraordinary people are the carriers of the spirit of Leonard's inspiration. And it's an inspiration and a spirit that we hope you will experience tonight and enjoy. Thank you so much for coming. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, our friend, Reverend Ed Bacon, former rector of All Saints Church. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom, my dear friends of my soul and my heart at Leo Beck. I cannot tell you, I have chill bumps right now, just imagining that this is going to be played in that very sacred holy room where I've spent so many minutes of being enlightened in being convicted and in being indicted in being transformed by the great preaching of Ken Chasen and my dear, dear friend, Leonard Bierman. Uh, love to Joni, to Allison, to all of my friends, including the kids who call me Rebby Eddie, which I really <laughs> love. So um, I am in Atlanta as an interim rector of a downtown progressive large church and have been here for two years after I flunked retirement, after I left and retired from All Saints Pasadena. And I quote Leonard Bierman every day. I feel Leonard Bierman every day. I feel Leo Beck, Ken Chasen, all of you, every day. You were a part of the, the furniture of my soul for interfaith work for interspirituality work, two different things. And uh, I love praying with uh, my new friends here in Atlanta, Jews, Muslims, Baha'is, Hindus, and atheists. So I'm really grateful to be here. And I always want to honor Leonard and particularly on this, his 100th birthday. Love to you all. And Jim Lawson. James Lawson is also a guiding light of mine. Most of my work has been for peace and justice for all. I was a conscientious objector to Vietnam and to all war. Uh, when I was a young man in my 20s, I um, was discharged after being a second lieutenant in the army when I came to understand that war doesn't work. And in my association with James Lawson, I have gained so much both ballast and courage and enlightenment because he has been one of the national treasures when it comes to teaching nonviolence, insisting on a life of nonviolence and making sure that we pursue all justice matters through a nonviolent path. I have had him as uh, a forum speaker since I've been in Atlanta. And at age, he was then 92. Um, everybody was saying, oh, what a teacher. So I'm here to give witness to the power and the longevity and the potency of the teaching of James Lawson that extended not only to his own heart through Martin Luther King Jr., Diane Nash, John Lewis, all of the peacemakers in Los Angeles and throughout the world, including this kid. So thank you God for Jim Lawson. Thank you for Jim Lawson and his wife and his family. Thank you for Leo Beck Temple holding him up on this sacred 100th anniversary of the dear Leonard Bierman. Blessings and thank you. Good night, everyone. Ed, thank you. Thank you always. I have the great, great pleasure 
to introduce Rachel Warby and a special gift to us of a musical interlude. Rachel is the creator and artistic director of the Musique, an extraordinary nonprofit performing arts organization. Thank you, Rachel, for being with us. Thank you, Joan, and thank you to everybody at the Bierman Foundation. It is such an honor for Music and me to join you this evening. The Africans who were brought to this country as slaves sang the first folk music that they knew were spirituals. And the Africans who were enslaved here brought with them from their native land religious and cultural traditions of storytelling. So it is no wonder that the story from the book of Exodus, when God says to Moses, go to the Pharaoh, go to Egypt, and take those Israelites out of bondage, grab them from the Pharaoh, that that story resonated with those enslaved Africans. The great Reverend Otis Moss III of Trinity United Christ Church in Chicago has preached and written, never confuse position with power. George Wallace had the position, but Rosa Parks had the power. Lyndon Baines Johnson had the position, but Martin Luther King had the power. The Pharaoh had the position, but Moses had the power. Please join me in welcoming two of Musique's most admirable musicians, Anthony Parnther and Alan Steinberger. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses. Way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Thank you all so very much. Thank you. It was an honor. And, and thank you for joining us. I am so pleased at this point, too, to introduce a Beerman inaugural fellow, Michael Tubbs. Michael Tubbs is a community and political activist, and we're delighted to have him join us tonight. Thank you. Hello, Michael Tubbs here, former mayor of the city of Stockton, and more importantly, a proud Beerman Fellow. And I am honored to have the opportunity to say a couple words about one of the greatest Americans this country has ever produced. And that's my mentor, um, my friend, my, my exemplar, um, Reverend Lawson. Um, I find, consider myself extremely blessed that in 2020, 2021, I don't have to open a book to read about Reverend Lawson. I don't have to go look at 
old YouTube speeches, but Reverend Lawson is still here, still leading the, still being a drum major for justice and still pushing us to creating a world that understands the basic tenets that all of God's children are born with dignity, that are their inherent dignity, and that the job of government and society is to honor that and allow people the opportunity to find their callings and to, and, and to reach their potential. And when I think of sort of the work I'm committed to, work around ending poverty in this country, work around making sure that government corrects all the things that government has broken, I, I, I look to Reverend Lawson as an example of what is possible. Um, just the arc of his life, from the significant changes he has made in this country, even at a time when he could be lynched, even at a time when it was even more widespread and more insidious in terms of the way black lives were treated in this country. But he has always stood tall and loud and clear as a voice and a conscience for this nation. So Reverend Lawson, I just wanna say thank you. I understand the opportunities I have today are because of the sacrifices you made yesterday. And the best way to pay homage to your life and your legacy is not to idealize the past or be too content in the present with progress, but to make the same sacrifices and to push and pull to where we need to be um, in the future. And I think for everyone watching who's wondering like, wow, I may not be able to mentor Dr. King. I may not be able to mentor the Nashville sit-in students. I may not be able to spend 50 years as a labor organizer and a minister and, and, and teaching nonviolence and ta tactician for 50, 60, 70 years. But that's no excuse. Because before... All of this, Reverend Lawson was just a person like each and every one of us who responded to a call. And in that response to service, in that response to the call, found the courage, found the clarity, found the skills, and found the success. But none of that was a sure thing when he said yes to the call of service, when he said yes to making this world a better place. And that's what the best way we could pay homage to him and to the Beerman Foundation, frankly, today is to also individually say yes to service. And once we say yes to the call, the steps will play themselves out. And there'll be setbacks and set ups, but you'll, we'll still be able to push forward to a world in align with Reverend Lawson's worldview, a world that is a beloved community, a world that is a reflection of thy kingdom come, thy will be done a world that understands and treats all of God's children with basic human dignity. So Reverend Lawson, on the behalf of my generation, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. And I'm so glad that we're able to give you some of the roses you deserve while you can still smell them. The loveliest of all of the blessings of our being together is the blessing of Jim Lawson and what he has brought to my life and to your lives as well. Just to be touched by that is to experience some of the wonder and the dignity of being a child of God. To be in this sacred space where Leonard stood as poet and prophet and pastor passionate advocate for life itself, human life to be displayed before the splendor of God's eternity. I've always been thankful that I could work with Jim year after year in the work of peace. I saw the power and wonder of God in that man. We who sense that there are invisible worlds and values, invisible visions that we try to live by personally and that we know are the visions of truth and reality, no matter who speaks to the contrary. We who sense through our own lives that the impossible is possible. I became convinced by 1950 after starting to study Gandhi and compare this with the life and work and teachings of Jesus, I became convinced that we in the black community could begin to change America 
through nonviolent struggle and action. All right. That's All right. reality. I did have that notion. I think the message is, is simple. That when a group of committed and dedicated people come together and understand as we understood as a result of the teaching of Jim Lawson. This man, I, I don't say it because he's here, but he imbues that sense of right, the sense of discipline in us. We couldn't turn back. We couldn't give up. We became his students. He taught us. He was our teacher. And he helped change America. The teaching of Jim Lawson gave us a way out, maybe a way in. What was the impact of this on the very, very beginning? I adopted, I accepted the teaching. That's what I just said. He, 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 was, he, was, he, he was a solid human being who I could tell from the very first workshop that this was speaking to his inner self in a way that he had never known before and that it was taking. He admired and loved Dr. King. Dr. King admired and loved him. James Lawson, one who has been in this struggle for many years. He's been to jail for struggling. He's been kicked out of Vanderbilt University for this struggling, but he's still going on fighting for the rights of his people. Good evening and Shabbat Shalom. I'm David Myers, a member of the board of the Bierman Foundation, and I'm honored to be here to mark the 100th birthday of our beloved teacher, Leonard Bierman, and to introduce this year's Bierman Foundation Social Justice in Action Award winner, the Reverend James Lawson. You re may remember that it was Jim Lawson who bestowed the inaugural Social Justice in Action Award upon his student, the late John Lewis, the legendary congressman whom Reverend Lawson introduced to the Torah of nonviolence in Nashville in 1958-59. My job tonight is at one level, the easiest task I've ever had to discharge. At another level, it's incredibly daunting. In the first instance, Jim Lawson is the embodiment of social justice in action. So the story of the award really writes itself. And yet in the second instance, how do you summarize 70 plus years of brilliant thinking, tireless energy, and an unerring moral compass. It's really a merit to possess one of these qualities. Jim Lawson possesses all three. And so you see the dilemma. Let's begin with a basic starting point. Jim Lawson is a man of faith, indeed of scripture. I was reminded of him when I was reading the Torah portion for the fourth day of Passover last week. There in the 22nd and 23rd chapters of Exodus, we read the following injunctions. You shall not ill-treat the widow or orphan, you shall not exact interest from the poor. You shall not side with the mighty to do wrong. You shall not oppress a stranger. Here we have the biblical foundations of Jim Lawson's sacred life work, his unceasing impulse to act on behalf of the downtrodden, an impulse so capacious as to defy imagination. Whom didn't it include? Black, brown, Asian American, Jewish, Palestinian, Muslim, immigrant, women, LGBT, Q, workers, janitors, house cleaners. Jim has fought on behalf of the full equality and dignity of each of these groups and so many more. Well before the term intersectionality arose, Jim understood that discrimination and injustice were indeed wrapped in the cloak of race, but also in class and gender. Now, there's something ironic in Jim Lawson's status as a man of justice. He is a man of peace who believes in love and action but he is also a fighter, a fierce fighter in support of the exalted principle of nonviolence, which he learned in India in the early 1950s. There, he absorbed the Gandhian principle of Satyagraha, which in Sanskrit means holding to the truth. He brought that truth back to the United States and became the teacher of the seminar in the late 1950s, in which the future leaders of the civil rights movement, including John Lewis, were trained in what became known as the Nashville Method. Jim has never waned in holding to that truth until today. 
condemning violence from whatever quarter it issues. I was thinking of this recently when I recalled the famous book by the renowned theorist Franz Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth. For Fanon, violence can be cathartic, redemptive, even humanizing. It's understandable why Fanon argued as he did when he did. But that is not Jim Lawson's way. Nonviolence means nonviolence. And here, his true comrade in arms in nonviolence, as it were, was Leonard Bierman. The two fought indefatigably for the radical, liberating, all-encompassing power of love, not hate, of peace, not war. They met in 1974 when Jim moved to Los Angeles and quickly they began to find their way to all sorts of good trouble together. Vietnam, nuclear arms, El Salvador, immigration, livable wages, the Gulf War, equal opportunity to black students at UCLA. It is interesting to think of the lives of these two men, so distinct yet so entwined, born but a hundred miles apart in Southern Pennsylvania, educated in Ohio, and brought together, dare we say by the grace of God, here in Los Angeles. They formed, along with George Regas and the Hattut brothers, an extraordinary interfaith alliance, commencing a golden age of struggle on behalf of a single inviolable guiding principle that every human being is created in the image of God. This remarkable cohort of faith leaders was possessed of fierce intelligence, wisdom, passion, compassion, and a deep sense of agitation that not all were treated equally on God's earth. They were revolutionaries who were shaped the landscape of Southern California, lending us a language and the tools to struggle for justice. All of us here are their beneficiaries, their students. The Hattuts have passed. George Regas has just passed. Our beloved Leonard is no longer with us. But Jim Lawson endures, holding within him the spirit of his colleagues, holding on to the truth, the truth of nonviolence as the path to liberation. It is fitting that we honor Jim Lawson in the name of his dear brother, Leonard Bierman. It is fitting that we honor Reverend Lawson, who like Leonard, knew of no distinction between brilliant thinking and passionate doing, for the two were melted into one. And it is fitting that we honor Reverend Lawson on this Shabbat, when we read a Torah portion, Tazriya Mitzurah, that deals with those afflicted with leprosy. For we know that Jim, like Leonard, will always be standing with a leper, whomever society in its caprice designates that to be. The Leonard I. Bierman Foundation is honored to call the Reverend James Lawson a dear friend and a board member. He is a true American hero who has dev devoted the entirety of his long and immensely productive life to nonviolence, equality, and peace. Simply put, he is social justice in action and we are so pleased to bestow upon him our annual award. It is now my honor and privilege to present the Reverend James Lawson. The Jewish and black people in the United States have always had a linkage or a sensibility to one another that has meant we have often been in uh, the same struggle for change. I have known this probably all my life since at least high school. In terms of the politics of things, I have known that for a hundred years in the presidential years of our e elections in the United States, the Jewish community and the black community have voted always on the same side. We both know what it means, what it is meant to be in the United States with an invitation to be here that is hostile. <laughs> and if we have not thought that there was a wide enough difference between two presidential candidates, we knew on which side we had the better chance of continue, continue to make, uh, continuing to dismantle the hostility and to allow the United States to become more of the country it needed to become. 
the school decision of May 17, 1954, where the, for the first time uh, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP got the Supreme Court to make a unanimous decision that segregation does not permit equality. Jim Crow law e uh, obliterates the possibility. Segregation law and spirit and custom uh, is in contradiction to the Constitution. That between 1789 and 19, May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court has only given largely negative decisions to black people, to women, to Asian people, to Indians. So that Supreme Court decision of 1954 is what caused the emergence in many ways of a new spiritual awareness among all kinds of black people and Jewish people. We knew in the black community that the Eurocentric communities in the United States were largely too supportive of anti-Semitism and racism. I knew that. Uh, our most important allies, I think this can be said, the most important allies for the nonviolent movement of America, 1953 to 1973, and the most important allies in the South, where I lived for 17 years and worked directly with Martin Luther King Jr. in the development of that movement, uh, the, our most important white allies would, w were Jewish people. The Black Lives Matters demonstrations from May to August in 2020 have been studied and are being studied by scholars worldwide. And, and there, there is now the very clear knowledge from that so far, and it's still going on, that Black Lives Matter is the largest nonviolent campaign in the history of the United States. It is evolutionary from the 20th century. It's organic. It has produced close to 8,000 uh, demonstrations in more than 2,400 places in all 50 states, and it has been, according to the scholarship, 95, 97% nonviolent. There are these young white men who are weaned on USA culture of violence, and they think that nonviolence cannot do the job. So they come out in Los Angeles to demonstrations that the rest of us have created, and they preach nonviolence. And I've even had a couple tell me, well, we have to face the police arm in arm and do <laughs> wrestle with them on the front line. And I've done any number of workshops on nonviolence with, with uh, our creative groups working against that stuff abusing each other and beating up on each other and destroying each other does not allow for the human race to flourish in the fullness of humanity. What happened January the 6th, we either, our systems of life must teach that group of people that democracy requires character, a serious study and wrestling with issues and language of conversation that allows us to solve issues and live together. That the gun and the bomb and the tear gas will not allow us to develop in the 21st century. The USA people need to recognize that the underside of love is justice. 
and building a community where human freedom can be practiced <laughs> and can be enjoyed. Jim, on behalf of the board of the Leonard I. Bierman Foundation, I am so pleased to, in real time, offer this honor and award to you. Please accept it virtually now, and I promise you very soon it's going to be in your hands. But right now, Jim, please come forward and accept this honor. Thank you. I'm almost speechless with gratitude for this award from the Leonard Beerman Foundation. I pledge myself and my continuing life to that great work. Leonard, for me, was an example of the finest religion out of the Hebrew Bible into the New Testament. And so I take and accept this award with deep fondness for all that he meant to, to us and to me personally. I do contend that the sole force that creation has planted in every single one of us, which I have learned from the first chapter of the Hebrew Bible all my days, is indeed the power of creativity and the power of the universe that can enable us to transform our own lives, but to transform the life of our city, our nation, our earth. And how grateful I am to have had the chance to walk with Leonard Beerman. I know that one of the reasons God sent me to LA was so that I might, might experience the generous spirit and prophetic sense of truth and justice of Leonard I. Beerman. I'm grateful to the foundation. You know, you didn't say we should overcome just to be singing it. <laughs> we shall overcome. And people really felt that. People believed that. for joining us in this celebration. We're so grateful for your support and we invite you to visit our website, beermanfoundation.org to learn more about us and in the short term future to see the full version of the video of Jim Lawson. Meanwhile, our thanks again and good night. Last night I had the strangest dream I never dreamed before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamed I saw a mighty room, the room 
was full of men And the paper they were signing said They'd never fight again